Okay, thank you very much, Eric, and thank you very much, uh, Raúl, for the invitation. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is a disclaimer. I know nothing at all about uncertainty quantification, okay? I need it, but I don't know pretty much anything. So, <clears throat> what happens is that a few months ago, they opened some projects from the Ministry of Spain and Germany where you could ask for the project together in very few areas. One of them was the area of mathematics. So I was contacting uh, Raúl Tempone, and um, <clears throat> what he suggested is that we start by uh, basically stating what is the problem we have to try to find some kind of common ground, because you are the experts in uncertainty quantification. And from there, we can see if perhaps on the next call we can apply or we can see, you know, if there are some synergies to collaborate and work together. OK, so the, as you can see in the presentation here, I'm the third author because, you know, I'm, I'm not the expert here. OK, the experts are Oscar and Jamie, who know much more about this. So if I make a mistake on the part of uncertainty quantification, I'm really sorry. I will, however, try to motivate very well what part of uncertainty quantification we need and why, okay? By the way, Oscar is a PhD student who is about to graduate and Jamie Taylor is a professor now at CUNEF University in Madrid, Spain. Okay, so let me start. So my background, as Eric said, is more in traditional numerical methods, typically finite elements and in applications for geophysics, working with uh, oil and gas industries. Uh, in the very beginning for the extraction of oil and gas, now for other more environmentally friendly things like CO2 sequestration, hydrogen storage, and things like that. Now, uh, as you know, traditional numerical methods they have some uh, limitations. In particular, they are mesh dependent, and therefore you need uh, very fine grids to get accurate solutions, and this involves a high computational cost. Okay, and integral methods they have similar problems and so on. Now, so the idea is to use deep learning for simulation and inversion. And here I write uh, some of the advantages you can see in many of the conferences and many of the papers. The truth of the matter is that despite all these advantages being the curse of dimensionality, let's say the holy grail, but despite all the advantages, it has a lot of limitations that I'm not going to enter into detail here because I will try to focus on uncertainty quantification. But let me uh, at least say that uh, it is difficult to successfully use these techniques, this uh, physics informed neural networks and uh, similar methods when solving practical engineering problems. Anyway, I'm just going to go ahead to describe what we do. And for that, we start by posing the physical problem. We have a problem of electromagnetics. We typically, what we do is we send electromagnetic waves to the subsurface and they go through the materials. They bounce back to the receivers. And based on the signal on the receivers, we try to uh, decide what are the materials of the subsurface. We can do this with electromagnetics. We can do this with acoustics. We can do this with different kind of physical phenomena. OK, so basically we have a forward problem, which is to solve a partial differential equation, in this case, Maxwell's equations with boundary conditions. And then we have the so-called inverse problem, which given some measurements, typically at the receivers, we try to find the physical properties of the material we are trying to analyze. In this case, the Earth subsurface, OK? If something, by the way, is unclear, please interrupt me. I will be happy to answer as many questions as you need. Uh, but so far, let me go ahead. And then, following that uh, notation, we define the forward operator as this calligraphic Earth the inverse operator as that. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a neural network approximation of this inverse operator, okay? whose solution is defined by the argument that minimizes the difference between the forward operator applies to the inverse data and the original data. That is the so-called misfit of the data. 
Okay. I can enter into the details of why I put this F here, uh, but uh, believe me, it is necessary because the problem is that if I don't put this F, the output of the inverse operator is non-unique. And because it's non-unique, if you have two branches of the solution, I will explain it in a second with a very simple example then what you will obtain is uh, uh, if you remove the f you will obtain an average of all the branches rather than one of the solutions okay because the average of the solutions is not a solution itself that's the problem i will explain it with a very simple example in a second anyway for those of you who are uh, not familiar with neural networks this neural network approximation i built here it's simply a composition of functions this a, a1, a2, ak minus 1, ak are simply affine transformations, which means matrix times vector plus a vector. And this n is a so-called activation function, which is a nonlinear function, which is typically applied component-wise to the uh, input, which is typically a vector. So you apply component-wise a very simple nonlinear function. Okay? And this uh, type of activation function could be something as simple as the hyperbolic tangent or the so-called rectified linear, li rectified linear unit, which is this thing. So, uh, a neural network is nothing else but just this composition of functions, as simple as that. <clears throat> so, what we do uh, again is, uh, let me recall it, is to minimize this misfit of the data. And the expensive part here is to evaluate this f, this forward function, which corresponds to solve a partial differential equation, in this case, Maxwell's equations. David. Because we need to uh, solve this problem so many times, thousands or hundreds of thousands of times, uh, Solving this F is uh, extremely expensive. It can take years to solve thousands of problems or hundreds of thousands of problems. So Please. what we do is the following. What we really do in practice is we approximate this F with another neural network that we evaluate first and we train first, that is, we optimize first. And then once this is fixed, we put it here. This is one option we describe in this paper. The other option would be to solve it using physics-informed neural networks. But as I mentioned before, uh, we don't obtain the correct solutions because uh, it's very difficult to make it converge. Okay? Basically, the way we minimize this problem is with some gradient descent method. And what happens is that you end up in a local minima because these things are not convex. And because of that, uh, the solution you obtain is no close to the global minima, and therefore it's not good, and it doesn't work well. That's why we are doing this right now. At the David, same time, we are working you on me? improving this. Yes. Just a quick question. Do you really mean just the norm instead of the sum, or is it the norm squared that you would expect? Um, you don't need the square. It's the sum of the norms. Okay, but because this introduces some nonlinearity. Yeah, not only nonlinearity. It's like I mean, if you have L one, for example, then then you will have kinks, right, in the gradient. You do. You do. Yeah, I mean, you can put the square. It's not going to be much better because the nonlinearities are anyway there because of this activation function. Yeah, I, I'm not so worried about the nonlinearities. I was worried about the discontinuity of the gradient. If you put relu, like this activation function, you already have them. So I, I mean, I agree that perhaps the square is better. To be honest, I don't remember what we do really in the paper. Yeah, OK. But okay. we try with both things. And it's, it's difficult in, in both cases. You see. Thank you. Sometimes we use the L1 norm. Sometimes I'm sorry, I interrupt. I'm sorry, one more question. Now we use neural networks. Uh, what was before neural networks? Uh, did you try classical methods, some polynomial expansion, trigonometrical, Fourier? I do not know. No, we use finite elements. Finite elements, finite difference, integral equations. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, what we do now is we solve this with finite elements, and then we train a neural network. The reason why you need a neural network here is because you need this to be differentiable. And differentiable, not in the terms that it is mathematically differentiable. That doesn't really matter so much. I know Raul is going to kill me for saying that. What it matters is that the code is able to give you something that it claims is the derivative. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes of functions that are non-differentiable, but it gives you something. So therefore, credit this thing can continue running. Okay. okay. Because Alternatively, one can add here, one could put here a finite element code, but a finite element code is not differentiable. You cannot find the derivative of a finite element code easily. Okay. okay. Clear. Thank you. In, actually, the whole game, by the way, is, um, is really in the fact that the code has to be differentiable. This is the automatic differentiation is, let's say, on the bottom of all of this. This is the most important part. OK? Anyway, this was just a motivation, OK? We are trying to solve an inverse problem for geophysics, and the inverse problem doesn't have a unique solution. This was the uh, motivation. So now what we want to do is uncertainty quantification, because what happens often is that we find a solution of the inverse problem, but it has other solutions somewhere else. And because it has other solutions, uh, from the engineering point of view, perhaps you think you have oil and gas, you drill, and you find out that you don't have any oil or any gas because the correct solution was a different one. Okay, So this is a big problem. That's why we need uncertainty quantification to see how uh, worth is the risk of investing on that particular well, Okay, on that particular uh, oil reserve. So we did an approach for that. And uh, let me show you how it works. First of all, let me give you a motivation problem to put things uh, hands on. Okay, A typical forward problem will be x squared. Given an x, I return x squared. And the inverse problem will be the square root. So you have two solutions, the positive and the negative one, two branches. Okay. So if you try to do, as I mentioned before, the misfit without writing here the forward problem, what you get is an average of both branches. You get that the solution is this of the inverse problem, which, as I mentioned before, is not a solution of the problem. OK? It's a disaster. Because it's, it is giving you the average of both of them. So this is what we don't want. Now, so we have multiple solutions. And what we want is to describe both of them with uncertainty quantification. So this is the real problem we have. OK? From now on, I'm going to describe what we did, which is by no means optimal. And it is there where it will be of great uh, help if you uh, try to solve this problem in the future and we can collaborate on that. Anyway, so basically, we have a structure of what we call an autoencoder because we have an encoder that provides a solution of the inverse problem and the decoder that has this forward operator that gives you back the original data, OK? So again, you have uh, an input, you have the inverse problem, and then you apply the forward problem. And you want the misfit between this i and this hat i, I mean y and hat y, to be as small as possible. So if you do that, and you put the right uh, forward operator in front, what you obtain is one of the branches of the uh, inverse problem. Not both of them, but one of them. Which one? It depends upon how many data you provide on the top or on the bottom branch. Just one of them, randomly, let, let me call it this way. Now, <clears throat> so what we want is to start uh, using a stochastic formulation where we add some uh, noise that follow uh, some kind of distribution and we have an inverse problem given by a PDF uh, known as the posterior. OK, so we are going to apply bias theorem. The posterior is given by the likelihood times the prior divided by the normalization constant. And we assume that the uh, noise is given by a Gaussian with zero mean and some variance. And 
What we want to do is to approximate the posterior distribution using some parametric distribution given by a neural network. Okay, and at this point, I start getting lost into some of the details. So I, I will try to explain it the best possible way I can. But uh, if you want details, I will give you the paper where we do it, and, and it is published, and and you can see all the details now. So we have a variation autoencoder. We have the input, the output layer that now are the parameters of a distribution. Okay. For example, it could be the mean and the variance of a Gaussian distribution. And from there on, uh, we apply the forward operator. And then we have a loss that is given by this. Uh, is here? No, it's on the next slide. That is given by the so-called Coolback cool labor divergence, and it's given by this uh, integral. Okay. For those of you who are familiar, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this Coolback uh, labor divergence. I think it's very standard. For me, this is like a miracle, but uh, this is what we use. Now, this is because we are now working with probability distributions, so we need a loss that uh, can compare two different probability distributions. That's why we use this one. <clears throat> and it is used in multiple papers uh, trying to solve a similar problem. Now, so in here we have uh, the previous solution we obtained. And now with the variation autoencoder, what we get in addition to these dots is the error, OK? Or if you want the variance. In other words, where are 95% of the solutions? They should be between here and there. However, this is not still what we want because uh, it is still focused on one particular branch rather than on two of them. So in order to be able to obtain both solutions, what we are going to consider is multimodal variation autoencoder. This is nothing else but simply to describe the distribution as a sum of Gaussians, that is, as a so-called Gaussian mixture density, rather than as a single Gaussian. Whether this assumption is correct uh, for this particular problem, we have yes, because I know if we have two sums of Gaussians, this will be OK. For the real problem, uh, selecting only a sum of Gaussians is not enough, because you can have uh, an infinite number of Gaussians uh, in terms of the solution of the inverse problem. Anyway, that's what we do. We describe this uh, distribution as a sum of some coefficients times some Gaussians with some average, I mean, or some mean and some uh, variance. And uh, here is an example of a bimodal Gaussian mixture density. And we try to solve the problem with that. OK? So now instead of one Gaussian, in here we have uh, some of them, same as before, the same laws, the same encoder decoder structure. And uh, now what we obtain are multiple solutions. The intensity of each solution is given by the coefficient of the Gaussian. So in this problem, now we obtain these two solutions. And the probability of both of them, as you see, in both cases, is cl very close to 0 0.5. So this is excellent for this problem. OK. Now, uh, if we go back to our original problem, which is a geophysical problem given by electromagnetics, in this case in one dimension, what we do is we put here a source. We send a wave that goes down. It uh, bounces back. And we have a receiver at the same position. OK, we assume materials are one dimensional, that is, uh, you only have uh, um, variations along the vertical direction, but in horizontals, they are just straight. Okay, And we apply this at different frequencies. Those are the so-called frequencies omega 1, omega 2, omega n. Anyway, so we have a number of layers on the subsurface and with some given thickness. We assume now that the thickness is fixed because this simplifies the problem. If the thickness is not fixed and we need to find it out, it's a much more difficult problem again. And what we are trying to find is the so-called resistivities 
and so-called faces of the subsurface. That is two numbers per layer. That's all uh, we are trying to do. Anyway, so this is a description of the subsurface. And in here, what we have is this is the depth from zero meters all the way to 2,000 meters down the earth. Okay. And in here, we assume we have one layer, and here another layer, another layer, another layer, another layer. And on the surface, at different frequencies, here is the frequency, in this case, as a period, that is in terms of time instead of, instead of frequency, that is one over the frequency. And this is the response we obtain on the surface. This in terms of uh, resistivities, and this in terms of phases. And what we are trying to do is to find out what are the properties of these uh, subsurface materials, OK? So in here, what we obtain is that there is only one solution. The other ones they have, uh, the other ones of the Gaussian of the multivariate Gaussian have almost zero coefficient. And the solution here is the red one, which is very close to the black one. And in green, you see the confidence, uh, uh, the confidence area. That is, uh, we are sure this is the solution up to this confidence, which is quite large, by the way, quite large. And with this difference in green, what you will obtain are this difference in the measurements, okay? Which are not so large. They are, uh, in other words, it's expected that the noise of the recorded measurements in reality will be within these two green light, green lines. And this, in terms of amplitude uh, of uh, resistivity, this is in terms of phase. Okay. Now, in here, I think we can visualize it better. And this is the graphic I really want. At the end of the day, this is what I really want. This is my solution. The red one is the exact one. And the green one is what it returns the numerical methods. It tells me it will be more or less the red one and uh, with these distributions. OK? So, so far, this solution is quite good. And I'm quite happy about that. Now, if instead of three layers, I put five layers, Again, I get the same things. Now the uh, uncertainty is bigger. And now this is the solutions I obtain. The first layer is good. The second layer is good. The third layer is OK. The fourth layer is much more distributed. So we have a lot of uncertainty. And the fifth layer is again is good. It's again very good. So, so far, so good. If we put 10 layers, Again, uh, now the uncertainty is much bigger. The deeper we are, the deeper is the uncertainty. This is physically expected. And this is what I want. And as you see, the only thing is telling me is that in here, I can determine from the solution the first layer and the last one. And this is physically correct. This is what I'm amazed about. I know from physics that the layers I can determine uniquely with these measurements I have are only the first one and the last one. The last one, because at very low frequencies, uh, the last layer is infinite, OK? So I can determine it very well, not the, not the other ones. And as you see, the error in the other ones and the uncertainty is huge. And this is fine, because I know from the very beginning that from this data, I cannot recover the solution on, for example, these layers in the middle. If I will recover them, I will be suspicious because it is physically impossible. OK, so this is what I really like from all these results. This particular graphic, the fact that it is what it is telling me is fully consistent with the physics and is allowing me to learn new and more physics that are non-trivial. Because I have seen in some articles where people solve these kind of problems with a unique solution, and this is impossible. It's physically impossible. And practitioners on the field, if you talk to the oil companies, they know that very well. Okay, So this is extremely good result in that sense. Even if the result is negative, it's negative, but it is telling you uh, a lot of what it is really going on here. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm really sorry about all the details I explained incorrectly, especially those related to uncertainty quantification. But in here, you have all the details okay, on the paper. It is already published, and uh, you can see it there if you want. Even if it is in a journal of geophysics, it mainly focuses on the part of 
uh, Gaussian distributions, uncertainty quantification, and so on. <clears throat> so, the conclusions. Uh, if we apply this method, we are able to obtain multiple solutions. This is good. In reality, and in the moment you go to two dimensions or three dimensional problems, there is a problem because uh, the solution will not be a sum of Gaussian distributions. It will be much more difficult. For example, I know that sometimes it's like a Gaussian, but that that is like a tunnel that is infinite in one dimension and finite in the other, like a Gaussian, but then constant in one of the dimensions. Okay. So of course we don't know how to do that. Uh, this will require uh, uh, great expertise on uncertainty quantification and statistics and all these things that I'm not uh, sufficiently confident about. I mean, in other words, I don't know about them. Um, so, so far it's working well for this example, but we know that if we go to 2D or 3D, this is insufficient. We need more than that, okay? But it's still very promising. I mean, very promising this 1D results. So, we can also uh, play with the thickness of the layer. This will make the problem more difficult. If, of course, if we go to 2D and 3D, much more difficult. Ideally, ideally, we would like to go to multiphysics because what people really do in the field is they use electromagnetics and they use acoustics. Now, electromagnetics, the solution of the inverse problem is non-unique and acoustics is non-unique. But the non-uniqueness is different. When you put them together, the non-uniqueness reduces a lot. So. It is very unclear, very unclear how much it reduces this non-uniqueness, but if we will have a method like this to evaluate it, it will be absolutely incredible, okay? And also, it's very important to uh, not only to give results in terms of solutions, but to determine how uh, confident are with those results. This for the industry is super important because we are talking about investing millions and millions and millions of dollars in each small decision and we need to have some kind of uh, confidence or uncertainty about it and that's about it and that we are in Bilbao we are always looking for PhD students postdoctoral fellows now we have a uh, doctoral network uh, mainly on uh, pins and related methods on physics informed neural networks and so on anyway so that that's a summary I don't know if this is good enough to 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 see what are our problems and how a collaboration uh, could be put in place in the future or so on. Anyway, thank you very much. Really appreciate it.